businesses and people, anything and anyone causing a ripple in the community. And now, let's dive in to The Splash Live. Good morning and welcome to The Splash Live. Dave Scott right here in our fantastic Splash Live studios. Our connection together right here in our fine communities of West Bloomfield, Orchard Lake, Kegel Harbor, and Silver Lake. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Splash Live, part of 90 Minutes Live and local television each and every day here on Civic Center TV and all of our other outlets. Of course, we start at 930, very local programming lineup. 10 o'clock, Tyler Keith will be in with the Megacast where he takes a look at stories right here at home, but also a little wider view of what's going on in our area. 90 minutes of live local television each and every day on Civic Center TV and we have big news later on in the week about this program and some adjustments that we're going to be making that I think you will be very excited about. More on that coming up later on in the week. Right now let's take a look at our amazing weather forecast here in the greater West Bloomfield area and it is going to be an absolutely beautiful day. 67 degrees already. If anything, maybe a little bit too warm. 85 will be our high today. Good sleeping weather over the next couple of nights. Temperatures in the 60s, and you can see as we get into Friday, chance of just a little bit of precipitation in the area. But all in all, really nice weather pattern that we're in. It started to feel an awful lot like the middle of summer, not really the end of June or the middle of June. But uh, I'm not complaining. Beautiful weather for your activities today in the greater West Bloomfield area. So, um, on today's show, do, we didn't do our where we are thing, did we? I skipped right by that. Um, here's how you watch. <laughs> Thanks, Jared. Here's how you watch. He's got to keep me on the straight and narrow path here. Here's how you watch Civic Center TV. You can watch us on Channel 15 on Comcast, Channel 99 on AT&T. We're also live on the web at civiccentertv.com in full high definition. Our live video is there. Our brand new improved program schedule is there. And you'll also be able to tune in and check out any any of the archives of the great shows that we've done in the past. It's all for you on Civic Center TV. We're streaming on Facebook. We're streaming on YouTube this morning live. Just look for Civic Center TV. And thank you for tuning in on the radio where I love to be 89.3 Lakes FM, our very own local FM radio station. So as I think about radio and my career in radio here in, uh, in Metro Detroit, it all started out on, on WBLD 89.3 FM and then went on and I had a great opportunity opportunity to be on some of the leading radio stations in Detroit. As I was on the air, hanging around, always was a really good friend of mine, and I say hanging around, reporting on our activities and reporting on what's going on in the music scene. One of the top music journalists in our country, Gary Graff. Gary is going to join us on the show today. Gary will be in West Bloomfield tonight at Schuler Books. We'll talk about that uh, in just a moment. He's got a new book out all about Alice Cooper, Detroit's own. No one better to write that one. Gary will talk about his amazing story, which exceeds just his coverage of music and the music industry. Some of the things he's done in his life, remarkable. And uh, we'll talk about that as he joins us a little bit later later on in the program. News from Lansing today, our state representative Noah Arbett is very happy that his hate crimes bill has passed the Michigan House. Not easy for a rookie state representative to be so successful and get any kind of a bill passed and get it passed with bipartisan support. Noah, good job on that one. He thanks his colleagues and his amazing legislative director, Joanne Wisely, and of course the Attorney General, Dana Nessel, and and others. So uh, there he is on Facebook. You can read the whole story this morning and get more of the information. But uh, great job, Noah Arbert, to get that bill moved along, and we'll keep an eye on the progress. Well, to celebrate the release of the new film, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, our own tree runner right here in West Bloomfield will be hosting an Indiana Jones Twilight Climb session on Thursday, June 22nd. That is tomorrow from 5.30 until 8 o'clock. Climbers who attend will receive a free copy of what you see right there on TV. The Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny mini poster, the real movie poster, but a smaller version of it while supplies last. Of course, The Dial of Destiny opens at theaters on June 30th. Another great uh, movie in the Indiana Jones series. Going to be a lot of fun. 
connections. So you're saying, Dave, very cool. Uh, maybe you could just reset the whole connection to Tree Runner. Well, the Tree Runner Adventure Park is kind of like you being Indiana Jones because it is a forest recreation area with zip lines, climbing platforms, elevated bridges. We got a picture right here that Jared can throw in here when he gets a minute. And uh, elevated bridges and a whole lot more. I mean, doesn't that look like you in an episode of Indiana Jones, so you can go out there, do some of the stuff that maybe you would see in the movie to a much lesser and safer extent, have a whole lot of fun. Great for adults, but really great for the kids as well. Uh, the Tree Runner Adventure Park here in West Bloomfield, right by the Jewish Community Center at 6200 Drake Road here in West Bloomfield. One of our great assets, and uh, really nice to see they're getting us all excited about the new Indiana Jones movie coming on June 30th. The well, Kroger Community Rewards Program, if you're not aware of it, it's a really great program that allows our many community organizations, service clubs, and whatnot to raise some money in conjunction with Kroger. And the Greater West Bloomfield Historical Society today on Facebook and through our show is reminding you that all you need to do is shop at Kroger and then swipe your plus card. And that we're going to give you a link here in a minute with the QR code. You just need to select the Greater West Bloomfield Historical Society as the organization you want to support. And as you know from going through Kroger right there in Orchard Lake Road or any of the other Krogers around Metro Detroit, if you happen to be in one of those, um, they ask you if you want to make a donation, a part of the proceeds from the sale to a local charity. Our friends at the Greater West Bloomfield Historical Society are saying, hey, what about us? So there's the QR code. And uh, you can get all the information right there. You know how to work the QR code? Take your phone, put it up by your television or your web browser, and take a picture of that. When you go to, like, your picture thing in your phone, it's going to grab the QR. You know you know how to do the QR code. I won't waste your time with that. But, but that will take you right to the page with all of the information about this Kroger Community Rewards Program. And again, our friends at the Greater West Bloomfield Historical Society are looking for your support of their organization as you go through Kroger. Talking about the Greater West Bloomfield Historical Society, I thought we'd take a flashback. We certainly have an issue, and let's not hide from it. We certainly have an issue here in the West Bloomfield Kegel Harbor area as the West Bloomfield schools have moved all of the education out of Rosa Roosevelt Elementary, legendary Roosevelt Elementary um, in Kegel Harbor to another school that was a former middle school, which is now the new Roosevelt Elementary. Um, we passed a bond issue. There's going to be new building and construction projects. There's a lot of planning going on at the school district, how to deal with all these buildings. Clearly, we've got some older buildings uh, and they likely aren't going to be using all of them. So that plan needs to get worked out. I can tell you from sitting in a recent planning session in Kegel Harbor that they're looking at doing anything they can to, if that school site becomes available for somebody else to use and it goes on to live another life, they're starting to have some just soft discussions about uh, what they can do to help facilitate that and make uh, sure there's a really good positive outcome for the community and it has the best result possible. And I know there are people in Kigo, uh, maybe you watching right now, that have a lot of concerns about this. So we just got brought it up this morning and wanted to let you know. But uh, because we were talking about the Historical Society, I thought I would add a little history here. If Gina Gregory from the Historical Society was here watching right now, she would love these pictures. So let's check this picture out right now. Check that out. That is a great great old classic picture of Roosevelt School. Now remember, back in the day, that big, huge, beautiful school for our community uh, wasn't just in elementary. It was serving all of the grades. And, um, and, you know, that's where high school happened as well. High school, then junior high, elementary, all of it. It was one big building where all the education in the area happened. Here is a picture. We got a couple other pictures. By the way, thanks, James, for that picture on Facebook. And uh, here's a picture from Patricia Jubinville. And this is the class of 1937 from Roosevelt School. And as it turns out, um, Patricia's dad was in that class. And we even have a picture of his diploma right here uh, from Roosevelt School. So it's totally understandable with the history of our community, with all of the connections that so many of you 
have, especially in the Kegel Harbor community, to that building. And it's just been a part of your family um, that as we figure out what the future looks like, that there's going to be some decisions that need to be made. But a great history that we will always honor. And we'll look forward to see what plans are going on. And we'll keep you up to date as to what they're planning at the school district and what plans are underway in Kegel Harbor as they develop for that big, huge key property. Our good friend Mike McKinstry was on the program yesterday. Mike is known to anyone who watches the Discovery Channel as the Basquatch Hunter. He has a tremendously successful program running nationally on the Discovery Channel and also running on YouTube and other outlets. Now, as you know, Mike is a West Bloomfield resident, shoots most of his episodes right here on our lakes, on his kayak in all of our area lakes, and is always working on new stuff. He's done stuff with the fire department and many the other organizations, works with kids in our community. We really respect everything he's doing and, and his connection to our community. Great opportunity. So Mike has given us at Civic Center TV his next episode that features Doug Gans, who is the chef at the Orchard Lake Country Club. He's given us that episode. We are going to premiere it tomorrow on Civic Center TV. It's going to be the nationwide premiere before it ever airs on the Discovery Channel or YouTube or any of his other outlets. We'll have it on the channel tomorrow. I urge you to stay tuned. It's going to be really exciting. We thank Mike for that opportunity. And it's awful nice of him to do that. It also sets us up for the opportunity to maybe win a regional Emmy Award uh, for Mike. And I say we for Mike to win a regional Emmy Award for his airing on our regional channel. Previous episodes that we've run for him um, have uh, received nominations. Hopefully this episode he'll go all the way and win the big Emmy Award. So um, watch for that right here on Civic Center TV. We're going to take a break. When we come back, I I'm really looking forward to this. Uh, my friend, Detroit legendary journalist, uh, a guy who knows the music industry better than literally everywhere, uh, worked for the Free Press for years, worked for a number of other outlets. You see him and hear him on, on media outlets, on the radio, not only here in Detroit, but around the country. Uh, and he will be here in West Bloomfield tonight promoting his new book about Alice Cooper at Schuler. So we're going to talk all about that, talking about Gary Graff. And Gary joins us in just a minute live after a very quick break right here on the Splash Live. I'm Dave Scott, and we'll be right back. We'll be right back with the Splash Live. Hey, Bobo, do trees tell each other stories? I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't know that. Hey, why don't we go find out? Listen. Can birds draw pictures? I don't have an answer for that. Dad, do stars visit their friends? Look! And now, back to The Splash, live. Well, good morning. Welcome to The Splash Live. Dave Scott, joined now by Gary Graff, music journalist extraordinaire. Gary, I got your whole Wikipedia resume here. I could read the whole thing, but let's just, you know, let's just get to it. I'm really excited to have you here. Gary and I are friends, and I've been a really crappy friend. I'll just say that because I'm not staying in touch with you very well. But I'm so so happy you're on the show today and, and equally happy that you'll be here in West Bloomfield tonight at Schuler Books. Great outlet, huh? And uh, talking about your new uh, book about Alice Cooper. Gary, good morning. Welcome to the program. Dave, hey, great to be with you. Great to see you again. Well, thank you. And uh, Alice Cooper, I mean, what a legendary Detroit rock and roller. I know you've written about so many, Bruce Springsteen, other like Bob Seger, other people here in Detroit, but uh, what motivated you to write this book about Alice Cooper? Well, what motivated me is a contract, you know, like so many of these <laughs> things. The, okay. this, is the third, this is the third book I've done with this particular publisher. And, you know, they came to me and they started, they had just started a series about musicians as they turned 75 years old. So they did a David Bowie book and an Elton John book, and they had Alice Cooper on the runway, and they knew of my history writing about him and covering him and felt like it would be a good fit. So, you know, it, was, it really was as simple as that. 
All right, well, it's, that's a great story. And really, let's talk about Rock and Roller 75. You and I are not quite there. We're working on it pretty hard, but we're not quite there. Not but, close. But you not, know, not when, even halfway. <laughs> when I was sit, sitting in the Wheels studio it, as a kid in the late or late 70s, early, it was the early 80s now that I think about it. And, you know, Van Halen would come into the studio and David Lee Roth and the whole circus. I know you know the whole, the whole story of the way those guys toured would come in. They, they would just do their thing on stage, backstage, in the radio interviews. Um, you know, back then, I could never imagine that many of these guys would still be around and, and performing and, and actually performing it very effectively at this point in their, in their, in their lives. Nobody, you know, really expected that. And Alice Cooper's may be a prime example of that. I mean, you know, you have this guy, scourge of society, right? You know, with uh, hack, hacking up baby dolls and playing with snakes. And then, you know, he would, he would cut his head off every night or he'd hang himself or he'd electrocute himself. I think everybody, you know, back in around 1973 or 1974, uh, figured this is something that would burn out. You know, there certainly was a part of society that felt that rock and roll would please, you know, burn out and go away, but but it didn't. And you now have people like Alice Cooper or Elton John or, you know, David Bowie, who's no longer with us and who we miss, but they are to our generation what Frank Sinatra, you know, Ella Fitzgerald, Duke Ellington, were to our parents' generation. You know, these are our icons and the people we we mark time with and we, and we still listen to now. Yeah, and it's really cool to see our kids and our kids' kids, uh, many of them as enthusiastic about this music as we were. I think Alice is probably a little bit misunderstood because um, the Alice Cooper that I've interacted with more recently is really an amazing guy and nothing like you would think he would be uh, based on his onstage persona. Well, there's, a, there's a great duality in Alice Cooper. There is the guy who's on who's on stage, who, like we said, hacking up the baby dolls, you know, all sorts of mayhem. Uh, and then there's the Alice Cooper, the other 22 and a half hours of the day, you know, who is a, you know, is just a very kind, nice, civic-minded, uh, spiritual person who, who really lives his life doing good things. I always like to say the thing I respect most about Alice is he talks his talk, excuse me, he walks his walk louder than he talks his talk. So he's not out there proselytizing or thumping his chest. He's just doing good things and being a good person. And who would know that from some guy who packs up baby dolls and cuts his head <laughs> off on stage? I'm taking a look at the backstage passes or credentials or whatever all those things are that are right behind you. And... You know, you've had an amazing career. You've lived a life that many of us only dream of. Going to a show, making that your livelihood, hanging out backstage, meeting all these people. Uh, and that's somewhat represented on, on, with all the, the, the badges right behind you. Talk about that. I, you know, it's, I mean, it's been great. I, it's been nothing but a blessing. This is, this is something I... I've been a writing geek since I was in fourth grade, and then sometime in high school when I was, you know, became a real music fan. I thought, gee, wouldn't wouldn't that be something great to cover? And I've been able to do it for you know the better part part of my life. Uh, the one thing I do say to people though is, yeah, it's great, and you get to do a lot of great things, and you got to be, and you get to meet a lot of interesting people. But it's a job too, and you have to, no matter what happens at the show or after the show. You have to come home and write about it, and you have to you have to treat it seriously. It is it is it really is a is a vocation, um, but it beats a whole lot of other vocations out there. Let me tell you. And uh, if you ever, if I ever hear me complain, I slap myself. Nobody <laughs> needs to slap me um, to to understand that. So yeah, it's been it's been nothing but a blessing, and to get to do not only the daily journalism that I do, but then do projects like Alice Cooper at 75 is really, really a great deal of fun. Oh my God, who's that? <laughs> take, it, take it away, take it away. <laughs> Journalist, author, Gary Graff with us. Gary, is Detroit special from a music standpoint? 
Absolutely, Detroit is such a, such a great music city and I'll hold it up against all of them. New York, LA, uh, London, Nashville, Austin, Detroit has its own, it doesn't have its own flavor, it has its own flavors. I don't know many cities you can go to where it's not just rock, but it's jazz and rhythm and blues and hip hop and the place techno was invented and, and a gospel community second to none. And having said that, that's just the tip of the iceberg of, of really an amazing music community. We have the blessing of being this society that was created by the, the Northern migration of the industrial revolution, you know, of the people, especially coming to work in the car plants during the 20s and 30s, and they brought all their culture with them. So Detroit's been such an incredible melting pot of different styles and influences that, and it, it all seeps into one another. I don't think Parliament Funkadelic could have been born anywhere but Detroit or was not was could have been born anywhere <laughs> but in Detroit because that's where you have everything happening with such potency and such vitality. They just bleed into each other. Well, they do influence each other a lot, but you're right. I mean, we have so many different unique musical genre, and this is absolutely cross-generational. This is just not something that, you know, Barry Gordy and Bob Seger did, and then it was gone. It just keeps happening and keeps happening. There's, there's got to be something in the water here. Uh, it's the or, water. It's, it's, it's the water. <laughs> it's the DNA. It's on the streets. You know, I mean, they, and it's a music community that pays attention to itself. So all these artists are paying attention to each other. The rock people aren't just listening to rock and roll music. You know, they are rubbing elbows with other other members of the music community and they they do kind of learn and rub off on each other. Well, I hope you don't mind me sharing this. Um, I know the story, but I'm going to just read it here from Wikipedia, um, if I can find the note. But uh, I can't, but I know the story anyway. So, um, Gary, you were working at the Detroit Free Press. There was a strike, and you would not cross the picket line. I remember it very well. That ended your term at the Detroit Free Press. Uh, getting thoughts and uh, look back at those days and, and just taking that stand at that point in your career, that was a risky thing that you did. You know, listen, I enjoyed working at the Free Press for the 15 years I was there. It was a great place to work. Detroit was one of the last battle, two, two independently owned newspaper battlegrounds, uh, which was just, you know, coming out of journalism school and being able to do that was wonderful. The strike, well, listen, I still maintain we were in the right. I don't think the company, you know, dealt with us in good faith. Uh, frankly, I don't think our side was particularly well prepared for the for the war that it became. But I was raised in Pittsburgh, you know, in the in the bed of the United Steel Workers. Uh, I was not going to cross a a, a, line, a picket line for a union I was a member of. I was fortunate, very fortunate, that I did have a reputation and had established myself in a way that I could hang up my shingle and continue doing the work that I love to do. No, you've done it well, it's, but it's always risk, and you, you did assume some risk. And I, I, obviously by your words, you stand by that decision many years ago. You also, sure. you also are very involved in a lot of um, other efforts here in the Metro Detroit area, supporting the community as the producer, one example, the producer of the Detroit Music Awards. It's been, what, 30 some odd years that that's been going on, and, and uh, you've been a driving force behind that. We had year 32 and uh, co-producer because I worked sure. with, uh, with a lot of good people in putting it together, although I'm the last of the founders uh, still remaining. And, you know, it's a, it's a point of pride. We, we did win one of those Emmy Awards that you mentioned earlier because when the, pan when the pandemic hit, mm -hmm. in three and a half weeks, we had to turn what was going to be our 29th live show. I was going to be at the Fillmore. We had to turn around and make that a virtual show. And boy, was that a learning curve, let me tell you, just like just like everybody else uh, during that period. And we've maintained the, the virtual show. This year, we returned to a hybrid. Uh, we actually had a live viewing event for the show at the Imagine in Royal Oak. And, you know, maybe a model for the future. But when I was talking earlier about 
the bringing together of the music community so that they could kind of rub off on each other. That's one of the goals we've had with the Music Awards. It's the one time of the year we can put a, we can bring all the tribes together and they can meet each other and talk to each other and maybe there will be some collaborations and there have been some collaborations that have come out of that and we can we can not only honor the Detroit music community, but show the Detroit music community who they all are and introduce, try to introduce them to each other and make more good things happen out of it. Is there still a club scene? When, when we were kids, you know, we would go to the clubs on the east side and I'd chase around my friend Doug Podell, who knew that better than anybody. Uh, and still is, does. And he does, of course. Uh, is, is that scene alive at any level anymore? I mean, an old guy like me wouldn't know it, but is it still active? Uh, it is. There's still a very active and vibrant Detroit club scene. Uh, you can go out most any nights of the week and, and hear some original music. Now these musicians making original music have a lot of challenges anymore. One of them is this new preponderance of tribute bands. And listen, I totally get that. I totally get the appeal of that. But it is, it is choking off some sources for bands and artists who are making their original music. So it's a struggle within the scene to try to find a balance. Yeah, of that. But but yeah, I could, you know, I could sit here and and reel off the names of clubs all over the metro area from downtown Detroit to newly opened in Rochester to to down river in Wyandotte. Uh, it's, you know, in, and in Southfield, you know, there, there, there's jazz now. So it's, there's no problem going out on any given night of the week and finding some good live music. So tonight you're at Schuler Books in West Bloomville. First of all, very briefly, we're almost out of time. How cool is it that Schuler decided to put a store here in West Bloomville? I mean, the whole, your industry is really, the retail side of it is vanishing. It's gone. And, and here Schuler puts this huge, beautiful store in West Bloomfield. So you're going to be there tonight. Uh, talk about what's going on tonight. Yeah, and not just because they booked me for this, but I've been a Schuler fan. Um, I did signings of some of my previous books in their stores in the west part of the state, and that was around the time the Borders was going down, and here's this store that, you know, I don't know if they like the comparison or not, but it's a very Borders-like sure. book shopping experience. So tonight, uh, we're going to talk about the book. We're actually doing, it's going to be a live taping of the WWJ Daily J podcast with my buddy, Zach Clark. He and I work together on the Hello Pine Knob podcast. So Zach's gonna kind of moderate the discussion and then hopefully with a lot of Q and A and give and take between you know myself and those who turn out, uh, we're gonna lock the doors so that nobody can leave until they buy a copy <laughs> of the book. All right, you got and a copy which, there. I assume your books are available online and we've got about 30 seconds. Yeah, they are. Books are available everywhere. Books are sold up to and including the trunk of my car. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll see you and the trunk of your car and look forward to learning um, something new that we might not already know about Alice Cooper tonight and getting a chance to chat with you. Gary Graff, thank you so much for your time. Dave, thanks so much for having me. All right. Good to see you. Gary Graff, um, in West Bloomfield tonight, you, you, you want to be there. Schuler Books, 630. I'm going to make every effort to be there myself, and we hope you see there to see you there. That's going to be it for the Splash Live today. We'll see you bright and early tomorrow morning right here on Civic Center TV. Have a fantastic day. Enjoy the nice sunny weather, and uh, make today special. Take care.